This is the Grow Your Clinic podcast from Clinic Mastery. We help progressive health professionals to lead inspired teams, transform client experiences, and build clinics for good. Now, it's time to grow your clinic. Well, welcome back to another episode of the Grow Your Clinic podcast. My name is Jack O'Brien. It is Friday afternoon here in Newcastle, and I'm really excited to bring you another episode today. We have a guest joining us. I know these guest episodes have been uh, really well received. We've had a couple of reviews and ratings on iTunes and Spotify in the last couple of days, which I'll get to reading out for you soon in another episode. But today we have another guest and I'm really excited to welcome to the Grow Your Clinic podcast, Dr. Brett Hill. Brett, how are you going? Good, thanks, mate. How are you? I'm doing really well. It's been a long time coming having you as a guest on the podcast. Many of our listeners might be familiar with your podcast or your many podcasts. <laughs> Just uh, if, they're, if they're on the app and they're scrolling around, what are some of the shows that they could find, mate? Well, there's a few shows they could find with me on it. The original one, which was The Wellness Guys, which was, we started that probably about eight years ago, I think, as we were saying earlier. It was one of the, uh, one of the original Australian health podcasts before it mm-hmm. kind of boomed and got big. So I did that. Uh, I did another podcast called That Paleo Show for about six years, I think. And then my current show, which is called This Week in Wellness, is the one that you can find if you haven't looked around now for a bit of a a fresh update on what's happening in the health and wellness world. Probably a good one for some of those practitioners who just want a little snippet, a little tip mm-hmm. to share with their practice members or on their socials. So mm-hmm. this week in wellness is where I'm at at the moment. But obviously that is kind of morphed from a show into a podcast network. So we also have mm-hmm. the entire network called The Wellness Couch, which has, I think at the last count, about 23 podcasts on the network. Not all <laughs> of which I speak on, thankfully. Yeah, right. That's amazing, mate. I know that uh, I was listening to the Wellness Guys way back when. It feels like nearly a decade ago, which obviously it was. Yeah. And uh, this week in wellness, I was unfamiliar, but we'll be adding that to our CPD regime. There's a couple of other podcasts that our clinic, our clinic team like to listen to, the iMove You, etc. So uh, we'll be adding that in. We'll be able to listen to you week on week. Sounds like fun. Oh, this is good. Scary thought. All right, good luck. I know, right? I know. <laughs> uh, hey, uh, just to, just so we can get to know you a little bit more before we dive deep into your story. You know, you're a chiropractor by trade. You've built a personal brand and all sorts of collateral around that. Let's rapid fire a couple of quick questions. Is that okay? Go for it. All right, Dr. Brett Hill. What are you reading right now? I actually, I, I just spoke about this. Well, I can't remember what I'm reading right now. But what I have, what I have been reading, I just re- uh, read a. Uh, a fiction book. Um, I tend to alternate between reading more health oriented stuff and then more business oriented stuff, uh-huh. and then fiction, which is kind of my little break for my brain. So I've just read a book and I can't remember the something kingdom. Anyway, it was all about uh, Britain getting mm-hmm. invaded by the Norsemen and uh, that was fantastic. But prior to that, I also just read, which your uh, listeners are probably interested in, uh, Super Fans by Pat Flynn, mm. which is an absolute ripping book. So if people like podcasts, they may have come across the Smart Passive Income podcast, which is a goodie, mm-hmm. which I've listened to for quite a few years. And uh, Superfans is a great book that would fit in with, with your philosophy very, very well. So okay. I'd recommend that one. Yeah, right. I'm going to add that to my Amazon <laughs> and Audible straight after the back of this. That's you'll, awesome. You'll Thanks, mate. Let me, let me know what you think. You'll love it, I reckon. For sure. Who inspires you? Well, that's a good question. I would say my number one would be my kids. I've got two little kids, Tom and Charlotte, eight and 10, and uh, they inspire me all the time, not just uh, because they inspire me to want to do things, you know, to provide for them and to look after them and to create a world that, that I would like them to grow up in, but I think just because they have such a different view of the world. You know, they, uh, I love seeing the world from their perspective because they just kind of think out of the box and they're curious and they're inquisitive and, you know, I always try and maintain some of that sort of approach in my life because I think that's good to keep you a bit younger and a bit more youthful and a bit more, uh, you know, thinking a little bit differently. So I would mm. say my kids would be my number one. Yeah, mate. That's awesome. Love it. So what did you, when you were a kid, what did you want to be growing up? Oh, this is a great question. So this is funny. My mum has a picture. She hung on to it. I was in year three at school and I got asked to draw a picture of what I wanted to be when I grew up. And uh, I drew a line down the middle of the page and uh, mum was very excited because on the left-hand side of the page, I drew a picture of myself as a waiter in a suit. Um, and uh-huh. I said that I was going to be a waiter while I paid my way through university. Imagine how excited my mum was with that. First, <laughs> I was going to university. Second, I'd already figured out I was going to pay my own way. 
And, uh, and then the second page was actually that I was going to be a physiotherapist. Oh, so, right. Apparently, from pretty early on, I had a fair idea of the sort of, at least the general direction I was heading. Yeah, okay. It's, uh, now, I'm, this is no, in no way personally directed at you, but we often have a stab at uh, my other three partners at Clinic Mastery, Daniel, Ben and Shane, all wanted to be physios and uh, for whatever <laughs> reason, ended up in podiatry. Yeah. Was there a reason you didn't end up a physio? Um, well, I think it was a few reasons. Uh, one of the reasons I think was I actually have uh, two second cousins who are chiropractors um, okay. and they used to babysit me when I was younger. So I think that just organically, uh, to be honest, I think they're the only reason I actually knew anything about chiropractic or that chiropractic even existed. Sure. I've never seen a chiropractor. I didn't really have any experience from it. So that kind of led me to, to at least know of it. And then I think the, the next thing I think was probably that growing up, I just, I loved the outdoors. So I was into cubs and scouts and fishing and camping and I just loved getting out into nature. I was fascinated by nature. And so I think when I decided I was, you know, heading down this, you know, physio, doctor, chiro sort of path, I knew I wanted to do something where I could help people. And this fascination with nature just led me to start looking at, I guess, more natural approaches um, mm -hmm. and perhaps some more alternative approaches. And, and so that led me to start learning about chiropractic and, and really just, the more I started learning about chiropractic and understanding what chiropractors do and chiropractic philosophy and that sort of more vitalistic perspective, the more I just realized that that was me. That's what I wanted to do. And I think I'd always been a kid who kind of liked being a little bit out of the box and doing something a little bit different as well. So I think I kind of liked the fact that it seemed to push people's buttons that I was going to be a chiropractor. I remember <laughs> one of my aunties in particular was horrified because you know, I was pretty good at school. Like I did all right in my grades and stuff. Sure. I can just remember her being absolutely horrified that I was going to be a chiropractor and not a medical doctor. And, and I think that kind of appealed to me. I like the idea of, you know, pushing people with buttons like that. So that was a good uh, added bonus, I reckon. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, I guess you, there's been a bit of controversy coming your way over the years, no doubt. Voted yeah. well. Um, <laughs> yes. Tell me then in, that, in light of that, what's a motto you live by? Oh, that's good. Uh, be silly, be honest, be kind. Be silly? Be honest, be kind. Yeah, right. I like I don't it. Know. It, it. It's out there. You see it on posters and stuff. It's, uh, I don't know where it came from originally. I'm sure it does have an origin, but I've always liked that one. I think I found out later in life that actually my mum used to, I'd forgotten this and I told my mum this was my favourite quote. She said, oh, that's funny. I used to have that on the back of the toilet door when you were a kid. Oh, um, right. So apparently that's where it came from. I'm not that creative, but uh, <laughs> it obviously uh, sunk in while I was sitting there doing my number twos and uh, just hung around. <laughs> Yep, that's right. Back of the toilet door has power, right? <laughs> so be careful <laughs> what you put on the back of the toilet door. Yeah. <laughs> oh, mate, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing. Let's, uh, let's dive into your story a little bit, though. We, we touched on what you wanted to be, but how did you end up as a chiropractor and then owning your chiropractic clinic? Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, as I said, that, that philosophy, I guess, was what appealed to me. I, kinda, I actually decided I wanted to be a chiropractor pretty much before I'd ever seen a chiropractor. <laughs> I, I remember sitting down when I was in about year nine or year 10 and uh, being given the job guide. Remember that big book? It was like about two inches, like three a, inches Like thick. a phone book, yeah. Yeah, had every single job under the sun. And so I read every single job in the job guide because I was just that kind of kid and started looking for things I was interested in. And everything I was kind of remotely interested in, I circled and started learning more about. And as I said, the more I read about chiropractic, the more it just kind of made sense. And I was like, I think this is what I want to do. Uh, and then I thought, well, if I'm thinking of being a chiropractor, I should probably should go see one and see what it is they actually do. So mm -hmm. um, I went to a chiropractor. Uh, the first chiropractor I went to see was probably a little bit more sort of mechanistic um, and sort of, I guess, uh, crisis focused. Um, and that really wasn't sure. kind of what I was looking for or what I've been reading about and getting inspired by. So I think I went to see them a couple of times and ditched them and went to see someone else. And, and then, uh, yeah, found this great chiropractor noticed some differences in terms of my own health and well-being you know like I was never a terribly sick kid growing up but I was always getting sick like coughs and mm. colds and infections and I was asthmatic and I had trouble getting to sleep and you know, all of these sort of things I would never have ever related to chiropractic but but regardless seemed to uh, change as I started seeing this chiropractor and getting my you know spine and nervous system functioning better and so that sort of reaffirmed probably the decision I'd already made which was that was the approach I wanted to take and you know, it wasn't something, there wasn't at the time a chiropractic course offered in Adelaide. So okay. uh, very excitingly, there'll be one starting up next year, which I had a you know, very small part in helping happen, but um, nice. it's going to be an awesome program. 
And uh, so at the time, it was kind of this thing of, well, I had to, you know, start studying in Adelaide and then transfer across to Sydney. And I kind of like the idea of that too, you know, moving somewhere else, seeing something different, moving into state. So that was it. I just kind of jumped in with both feet. And as I said, the more I got, the more I started to learn and the more I got to meet these different chiropractors and go observe their practices, I was, I was definitely a bit obsessed with going and observing different practices and seeing what everyone did. Especially in chiropractic, there seems to be so many different approaches and different ways sure. of doing things that mm-hmm. um, I was kind of, I'm just, I'm a very eminently curious person by nature. That's probably one of my biggest strengths and biggest weaknesses, I reckon. And um, so I just went around to all these practices, like this little exercise book, and I just go in and, and just write notes of what I liked, what I didn't like. And essentially that was my practice. So by the time I finally graduated, I spent about 18 months uh, working with an associate in Sydney about came back to Adelaide, spent about 18 months working as an associate here. Just had a real drive to to want to do it my way. As I said, I had I literally had my whole practice drawn up in this little exercise book, ready to go. And uh, so I did. So I opened the doors and, and away we went. Amazing. And how did that evolve then into team and creating a brand around that clinic? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the clinic uh, evolved quite naturally and quite organically, I think. Um, because of the stuff that I was doing outside of that, you know, it, it tended to attract people to the clinic and, and tended to just attract, you know, my ideal people to the clinic as well, which was perfect. So it was more the, the other side of things, which was, you know, as I was uh, studying chiropractic and going to chiropractic seminars and other sort of health and wellness events and seminars, I was sort of just, you know, getting immersed in this information in the sort of health and wellness world, which I found fascinating, as I said, being so curious all the time. Mm. And uh, I guess the thing for me was I kept going to these events and I'd hear all this great information and think, this is amazing and this is going to be, you know, change the world kind of thing. And then you'd walk out the door and realize that no one else cared and no one else had ever heard of it, <laughs> had any idea what you just learned. And so I, I guess that sort of gave a bit of a push to me to think, well, you know, this is information that needs to get out there that I'd love to sort of share with people. So, you know, I started writing, the first thing I did was started writing some uh, columns for a local newspaper that sort of merged into columns for a slightly bigger newspaper, which was, you know, in the advertiser, the lift out in the advertiser here in Adelaide, which is our major sort of newspaper. That then led me to sort of compiling them all together and writing a book. I started doing a bit more speaking, speaking at chiropractic events. I spoke at a chiropractic event with a guy by the name of Lawrence Tam. And Lawrence and I started chatting and started, uh, you know, masterminding about what we could do. And and one day he said, let's do a podcast. And so so it just kind of, once again, very organically, very naturally, just evolved into doing more and more stuff outside of the practice, which was more, I guess in many ways, more altruistic of just wanting to get information out there and wanting to sort of share what I knew and, and help people essentially, uh, yep. which is now, you know, which grew pretty organically into, as you said, a brand and a business now of a podcast network. So, yeah. It's fascinating, mate. So uh, I think, uh, the, the, yeah, it does. And, you know, there's so many lessons. I'm thinking about the listener who, you know, I, I think we see beyond the maybe the differences or similarities between physio and chiro and osteo. And, and the lessons I'm picking up are around how you've been able to have that drive to start your own practice based on your lessons that you pulled from all of your experiences. But then realizing that as we go out and help more people uh, with no strings attached, and get our name out there and, and contribute to the world and to society that that naturally brought growth to your clinic. So how much of that was deliberate and how much of it just fell into your lap just by looking around and finding where you could write a column, for instance? Yeah, I wish I could say it was all deliberate. No, I, know, I mean, if it comes to writing a column, that was certainly a concerted effort. You know, I sort of went, well, okay, this is something I want to do. Where hmm. can I get in? Where can I get my foot in the door? And I remember, you know, I would contact lots of different people and contact lots of different editors and said look you know this is what I want to do and I found at the time like a lot of the smaller newspapers were very much kind of pay for content you know more uh, sure. advertorial sort of content so mm-hmm. you know everyone was keen for me to write a column they just wanted me to pay for it I was like well that wasn't <laughs> quite what I was looking for so yeah it did take a bit of concerted effort to make it happen but I think you know if I was to say you know the, the sort of three things the three biggest lessons I learned along the way that probably helped me I, I would say you know the number one as I said was really just being curious Number two was definitely just being willing to do stuff. You know, I've found along the journey, the biggest difference between the people who are, you know, doing whether it's columns or podcasts or, you know, getting a name out there, building a brand is just their willingness to actually just produce something just to put it out there. 
Um, mm-hmm. I'm sure you found the same with your podcast that, you know, just the act of actually doing it and recording it and putting it out there puts you mm-hmm. above, you know, a fair chunk of the population because most people mm-hmm. just don't get around to doing it. So, yeah. and then, yeah. And then I think the third thing, as you said, is just that willingness to provide content and to give value and, uh, and just understand that, well, yeah, do you know, what? to be honest, most of the time I did, I, I wasn't even really fussed whether it came back or not. It was just, I did it because that's what I like doing. And that, that's probably been the other big lesson for me uh, as I've gone along the journey is that if you want to be, sustainable in doing this sort of stuff and obviously you know doing it for eight ten years now is that you have to do what lights you up like you have to do what you are genuinely enjoying doing and giving and offering because when you do that then you know then you tend to get results first of all but second of all you can do that for the long term you know it's not just a you know i think a lot of practices and a lot of businesses you can get inspired to market or to do a particular approach or you know whatever it is for the short term Right. Um, but often you'll see then, you know, your practice will spike and then you'll get demotivated and then it dies mm-hmm. and then you've got that sort of roller coaster, which, which happens in many, many practices. And so mm-hmm. it's not necessarily just about figuring out what works. It's about figuring out what you enjoy doing that works. I think that makes oh, it matter. That's so true, mate. Yeah, we, we spoke just at our workshop on the weekend around, you know, it's that long obedience in the same direction. Eugene Peterson is a favorite author of mine and it's just, it's but sometimes just sticking around long enough to see the fruits come through. But I'm I'm interested, before we press on to the rest of your journey, at the start, and I know so many clinic owners wrestle with this, that fear of what if I put all my info out there for free, all of my IP, all of my content, and someone rips it off or I don't see the fruit of it. How did you deal with those sort of self-doubts, if you will? (laughs) Um, I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, I I don't think I ever had... I don't think I have ever had the delusions of grandeur that my stuff was that good, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was just happy sort of putting out content. And if someone read it, and you know, if someone other than my mum read it and enjoyed it, then that would be a great thing. Um, so I, I'm not sure that I was ever that worried about, you know, people ripping it off necessarily. And, you know, and probably I think I've always been, I've always had a pretty strong philosophy and pretty, pretty strong idea of what I believed in and what I, uh, wanted to do and share and and so I think mm-hmm. you know um, as much as that's not unique uh, in the world you know of having a slightly more vitalistic philosophy it's not as common it's not exactly the norm so right I'm not sure that anyone wanted to rip off what I was saying anyway so, so um, but, but there would have been plenty of haters though right or yeah, trolls yeah. perhaps there's been a few of those over the journey but I've always been pretty good at dealing with that sort of stuff I was always um I don't know, I remember when I was really young, I used to work at Bunnings. And uh, even as a sort of 16, 17 year old working at Bunnings, I used to be the kind of guy they'd get to come down when someone was carrying on, essentially. <laughs> someone was complaining because yeah. I was just, it didn't bother me. I was quite level headed about it. I knew it wasn't about me. And so I'd just go and you know, deal with it as it came up and, and move on. And so, you know, Charles really, it doesn't bother me. You know, they're, they're, I'm sure there's, there's been some funny examples of those over the time. And, mm-hmm. and really, I. I'm pretty good at just having a bit of a laugh about it and realizing that it's most of the time it's got nothing to do with me or the content I'm putting out there. It's far more about them than it's about me. And, and either just, uh, you know, having a laugh with them and, you know, playing along or, or just block and delete and <laughs> move on, um, depending, mm-hmm. you know, depending on how uh, offensive they're being and how much <laughs> I think they're actually willing to engage in a conversation and interested in, you know, learning and growing and developing or just flat out wanting to troll. I'll, uh, I'll usually pick one of those two options. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Fascinating. It's really good insights. Thank you. Because I think so many of us put on the brakes and and don't put our ideas out there for fear of what our colleagues might think or what if our opinion is slightly controversial or vitalistic. It's it's a really good lesson to just go for it. And really, the heat heat that comes back, you can either just deflect it or learn from it. I I love that, mate. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, exactly. And and stay within the confines of your regulatory guidelines. That would be the... uh, That'd be my big bit of advice that can, uh, mm. you know, you've got to be a little bit careful if you're being a little bit out there that you're not uh, putting a target on your back as well, especially if you're a chiropractor. They tend to, <laughs> we tend to have bigger targets than most sometimes it seems. Sure, and sure. Uh, so, you know, that's, uh, that's obviously important is, and that's been a, you know, a part of that process is figuring out, well, what, you know, how can I stay true to myself and what can I say that's within my regulatory guidelines, within my scope of practice, but still espousing, you know, my sort of philosophy of the world that I'd like to share as well. So. That's, a, mm-hmm. that's an interesting part of the journey. Can you tell us, Brett, the extent to which the wellness couch and uh, the paleo show got to? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, 
the Wanus guys was our first show, um, and as I said, it was really just started on a whim of like, let's try this podcasting thing. I, I literally didn't even know what a podcast was when Lawrence suggested it, so mm-hmm. I had to I had to figure that out. <laughs> he had to explain to me how it works, and uh, and we started just recording our show. We started asking people who wanted to come on and be interviewed, and you know, amazingly, they all said yes, and and some pretty big sort of names in the health and wellness world. I remember very early on, we had Rob Wolf come on, and and he was massive at the time. And so within about four months, it became the number one health podcast in Australia. Wow. And we had no idea. We only knew because one of our listeners messaged us and said, hey, guys, <laughs> you know that your podcast is the number two health podcast in Australia? And we were like, no. And, and I, my first question was, how do you know? Like, where are the rankings? And they said, yeah, it's right. iTunes. And I said, well, I don't have iTunes. So I downloaded iTunes so I could check whether it was true or not. <laughs> and, and sure enough, it was. And, and so we, we recorded a podcast about it that night. And then the next day, it was number one. So we got so excited. We were like, this is amazing. So, you know, so we got a pretty good viewership or listenership, I should say, right from the start. That paleo show was never to the same degree as the wellness guys, but it was probably, it got up there you know, in terms of downloads to about half of what the wellness guys was, which was pretty cool mm-hmm. for a, a bit of a niche topic. And nowadays uh, we get, uh, I think about 2 million downloads a year across the network. So, you know, it's a, it's a for, for a small sort of niche, you know, you know, in a smaller uh, nation in terms of podcasting, I mean, our, our podcasting market is obviously much smaller than the US and other countries. Um, sure. it's, a, it's a pretty good result for, for our niche to be getting those sort of numbers. It's pretty cool. What sort of opportunities has that since opened up for you? Oh, why well, are these cheese I could go in so many different directions there. Uh, but the, there's been heaps of opportunities that have come from the couch. So the reason I say that is that one of the opportunities was that I met my wife through the wellness couch. Right. Um, so, <laughs> Great excuse to start a podcast for uh, those who are single and ready to mingle. There you go. So she was, because uh, one of the things that it brought, gave us the opportunity to do was do more events and more public speaking. So we run now uh, about five events a year with the Wellness Couch Network and, and listeners of the network come along and you, know, you get to meet them in real life, which is a really cool experience. And so, yes, yeah, so we've got to do a lot more of that, like a lot more, you know, hands-on experience and a lot more, have a lot more impact on a lot more people's lives and, um, I think particularly from the live events, get to experience and find out about that impact because you don't online, you don't necessarily know or understand sure. the effect that the show might be having. So, um, and yes, and so the photographer from one of our, well, from all of our events um, ended up being my wife, which is, which is <laughs> a cool thing. So that was an unexpected uh, sidekick of that. Um, obviously, you know, as I've said before, lots of people coming into the practice and, and you know, the beauty of that is really, uh, you know, ideal practice members coming into the practice. Um, people who are really aligned with uh, you know, my philosophy and what I do and why I do it, which is sure. a really nice place to be. So those are probably, I guess that's probably the biggest uh, impact that's had. And obviously then, you know, more opportunities, I guess, just to share the message in different ways, you know, whether that's getting interviewed on podcasts or writing books or writing articles or, you know, just interacting and, and sharing that message to a bigger audience. You know, I've been interviewed on lots and lots of podcasts now, in Australia and some really big ones in the States and, and all that sort of stuff, which is really cool. You know, it's amazing when you get a message from someone from some you know, obscure country saying, you know, I heard you say this and this is how it impacted on me. And, you know, it's, it's yeah, very it's amazing, weird, isn't it? Kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, Brett, I really appreciate your humility through it all. And I think the listeners will pick that up, that this hasn't been about, you know, fame for you, but really it's, it's spreading that message and there comes a level of uh, whether it's celebrity or notoriety uh, whatever that might be it, it comes along but really it's, it's far more purpose driven for you is that right yeah absolutely we find it quite funny because we sort of we often say we're kind of like legends in our own lunchbox like if you're <laughs> if you happen to be in our tiny little niche and and you know be interested in the stuff that we talk about then then you probably think we're way bigger than we are and right. then, you know, nine to five, I can walk around the streets and like not a single person has a clue what I do. None of my mates yeah. really understand what I do. You know, it's, <laughs> so it's, it's a kind of funny uh, dichotomy there when, you know, we'll go to one of our events and it's kind of a big deal. And then, like you said, you walk out the door and no one else has a clue, which is actually kind of nice. Yeah, it's amazing. And obviously um, respecting your privacy, but it, it's probably allowed you to diversify your ability to generate income from the clinic sense, but there's books and speaking it's yep. not just your hands that are your primary tool of income now, is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's definitely changed over the last you know, few years in that, yeah, the, the income source is definitely much more diverse than it ever was before, which is nice, um, particularly as a, you know, as a practice owner and, and someone with a hands-on profession to have a bit more diversity there where it's, you, know, you don't feel like you have to be 
on the tools, you know, all day, every day in order to make sure you've got some money coming in for the family. You know, you, you do have other sources of income and, and other opportunities. And I think as much as anything, other, other opportunities to invest your, your sort of time, effort and energy as well. Like I'm, sure. I'm a bit, I, don't, I wouldn't say ADD, but, but I like having fingers in lots of different pies. Like the way my brain works is that if I was just working in one job doing the same thing every single day, I would go absolutely mental. And so it's, it's good for my sanity to have other projects that I can work on and change. A bit like I said before about reading the books. Like if, if I only read books on one topic and one genre the entire time, mm-hmm. you know, I'd probably lose my mind. I, I'm a bit the same with podcasts. I have a really you know, diverse range of podcasts that I listen to so that I just get a little bit of you know, different areas. And so, yeah, it's been great diversity, not just in terms of income, but in terms of just uh, you know, inspiration and creativity and, and sure. you know, being able to actions that I can do. I think I work a lot better when I have a, a little bit of diversity there as well. Love it, mate. Love it. And you've gone full circle now and you're just an associate. Well, I shouldn't say just, you're an associate. Chiropractor, <laughs> yes. Is that right? yes, exactly right. So uh, how did that yeah, eventuate? Well, I had my practice for about 10 years and obviously, you know, built it up, had a, had a few associates over the time, but obviously, you know, as you said, sort of spinning so many plates at the same time, it got to a point where I sort of thought, well, you know, what do I love about being in practice? And, and what I loved about being in practice wasn't necessarily bookkeeping or accounting or people <laughs> management or you know, dealing with landlords or you know, any of those sort of things that come with uh, running your own practice. You know, what I really love about practice is the people side of things. And, and, and I realized that with all the work I was doing within the practice, but then all the stuff I was doing outside of the practice with the podcast and everything, and obviously having wanting to you know, have quality time with the family as well, that it was, I kind of got to the stage where something had to give. And I really decided that the, the thing that sort of least you know, sparked me joy as uh, what's her name? Marie Kondo. Would say. <laughs> Marie Kondo, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's it. The thing that least sparked me joy was, uh, was the administrative side of running the practice. And, uh, and so I made the decision that that's what I wanted to do. And, and literally like a week later, the practice 50 metres away from my practice, just around the corner, called me up and said, hey, we'd love to have a chat with you. And uh, they literally came around and said, well, we want to buy your practice and have you move over and be an associate. And I went, great, that sounds perfect. Happy days. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, obviously it took a little bit longer than that to work through all the finer points and details, but it was, sure. uh, it was pretty well timed and pretty seamless. Looking back on that journey over the last eight to 10 years specifically, if you could change something, what would it be? The first thing that springs to mind is I probably would have, I would have done a better job of managing my finances when I first started my practice. What do you, what do you mean? <laughs> well, as in, I think I, I just kind of jumped in with both feet into practice and didn't necessarily, you know, never run a practice before, didn't really know what I was doing. I'm a bit of a big ideas person. You know, I'm, I'm great at big ideas. I'm not necessarily great at attention to detail. So, you know, in terms of managing things like, you know, income versus expenditure and, you know, making sure I'm up to date on tax and mm. <laughs> all the financial aspects, yeah, all the boring stuff, really, the stuff that I probably have consciously decided to get away from now or, yeah. or at least handball to someone else. I, I didn't pay enough attention to that stuff and I should have, you know, and, sure. uh, and I re- very quickly realized why I should have been and that that was important. So that was probably my biggest lesson when I first started my practice, I would say. I'm sure there's other big ones, but that's the one that springs to mind. It, uh, I hear that story day in, day out with clinic oh, owners sure. in the business academy. That's what we do. That's what we help with. Yeah. Uh, so uh, unfortunately, we weren't around 10 years ago for you. <laughs> no, I know. Um, I know. So in, if you were to speak to a clinic owner who's, who's maybe stuck in a rut or has a message they want to get out but feel a little bit hamstrung or their hands are tied, what advice, what inspiration would you have for clinic owners listening in? Well, I, I think the simplest thing to say would be focus on what you can do, not what you can't do. You know, it's really easy to sort of get stuck in where it might not work or where you, you know, what it, if you're trying to produce content, for example, you know, you might want to be writing a book and you might get stuck on the fact that you can't find a publisher. Um, but actually the answer might be, well, just publish it yourself, you know, right. or, or you might be worried about the, you know, maybe I haven't got all the right gear that I need to do a podcast, you know, but really as much as you've got your fancy mics and stuff there, for most of my journey, I've done my podcast with a set of speakers from my phone, you know, mm-hmm. as in a, an earpiece from your phone, you plug it in and, and cause it's easy for me to transport wherever I am, it's with me and I just do it that way. And mm-hmm. so 
don't focus on what you can't do. Don't focus on the setbacks. Focus on what you can do and just, just get out there and, and create and start doing it. You know, there, there's heaps of stuff that you can do. There's so many solutions out there. And, you know, I mean, really, there's no excuse nowadays because if whatever you want to do with whatever budget you've got, however you want to do it, there's a blog already written by someone that tells you exactly how to do it or a right. YouTube that shows you exactly how to do it. So uh, there's really no excuse. You know, there's no limitation of the knowledge out there of how to do stuff and, and how to overcome whatever that obstacle is. Matt, that is absolutely unreal. And uh, I know that'll really resonate with clinic owners, uh, those on the inside of our business academy. And you can contact me on jack at clinicmastery.com listeners if you want to find out more about that. But we can help you bring that to life. And uh, people like Brett are an incredible inspiration. Brett, if people want to check out your journey, your network, how can we find out about that? How can we get in touch? Yeah, absolutely. So if they want to find out about me particularly, they can go to drbretthill.com. They can find the shop there and, and I've got books and uh, various other programs and products and stuff there, uh, as well as obviously links through the podcast. Uh, and then if they want to find out more about the podcast network, they can go to the wellnesscouch.com. And so uh, there they can find all of our podcasts, um, all of our live events we do in Melbourne and also around the country. And connect in and obviously both of those have all of the links to you know instagram and facebook and all those sort of things that they can uh, come mm -hmm. and find out more about unreal mate we'll make sure we link all that up in the show notes so listeners you can head to clinicmastery.com forward slash podcast find the episode with dr brett hill and it will all be linked up there for your viewing pleasure brett thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today it's been an absolute pleasure to have you what's on for the weekend if we can leave with one last question well, this weekend I'm playing cricket tomorrow for the first time uh, in a little while. So, nice. fortunately, uh, we haven't got your hot weather. It's cooled off a little bit here because I'm uh, a bit out of conditioning as far as the cricket goes. So, that should be good. <laughs> and then hopefully this weekend I'm going to pick up a motorcycle. That's my plan. Oh, nice. Nice new whip. I love it, mate. Well, again, thank you so much. Have a ripper weekend. Listeners, thank you for tuning in. Make sure you head over to clinicmaster3.com forward slash podcast for all of the show notes, the links and uh, everything else related to Clinic Mastery. Brett, it's been a pleasure having you. Listeners, thank you for tuning in and we can't wait to bring you another episode again really soon. Bye for now. Thanks for tuning in to the Grow Your Clinic podcast. To find out more about past episodes or how we can help you, head to www.clinicmastery.com forward slash podcast and please remember to rate and review us on your podcast player of choice. See you on the next episode.